Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fifth and final webinar in our Asset Management Awareness Month series. My name is Kim Sager, and I'm the VP of Communications and Marketing. Before we get started and I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to run through some of our logistics. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our MPMA website and YouTube channel here shortly. If you are logged in and listening today, you will automatically receive CEU credit. Uh, and then we did post a couple handouts for this uh, webinar. They are in the uh, toolbox um, part of your webinar under handouts. Uh, it's the slide deck for today, um, as well as one other um, PDF that uh, Peter will go over. And then if you have questions during the presentation, please write them in the question box, and then we'll address them as we can. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Peter Collins, President and CEO of A to B Tracking. Peter has worked with many industries, including the Department of Defense, on the development of auto ID policies, such as barcode and RFID. He has a wealth of knowledge in developing and implementing RFID and barcode asset tracking systems in organizations around the globe. Peter has played a key role as a consultant to the DOD and the department's efforts to adopt the use of IUID technology in 2004. He received the ID Global Leadership Award in 2009 for his role in worldwide adoption of IUID and is an active participant in the IUID Trade Association. Peter, welcome and take it away. Great. Uh, thanks uh, for having me, Kim, and, and PMA. Uh, so today's session is focused on government property management systems. I am uh, here, uh, the founder and CEO of A2B Tracking. We build and install secure cloud-based government property management systems at A2B. Now, uh, I've also been a member of MPMA since 2004, uh, which hard to believe it's almost 17 years now. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. So. It really is, it's great to be part of such a dedicated group of professionals here at NPMA that continue to advance uh, their education in the role that they play in their profession here. So my role is to tell you what we're seeing here in industry today, and this is how I'm gonna do it. So to roll through the agenda, we're, we're gonna begin by discussing the motivations behind uh, property accountability and this DOD-wide initiative called FIRE, Financial Improvement and Audit Readiness. We're gonna talk about what the DOD really needs so you really understand their motivations behind it. And spoiler alert, it's good data. Good, accurate, complete data is what they seek. And we'll get into what that means to you. Now, we'll also cover DCMA's role in all of this and relative to the PMSA, or the Property Management System Analysis. We'll go over reporting through to government systems today and the expectations of defense contractors. As industry, what is your role in order to meet your obligation? And then finally, we're going to wrap up by discussing what a modern government property management system looks like. But you'll see throughout all the building blocks that go into understanding what today's property management system ought to look like. So we start off with the directorate. Financial improvement and audit readiness. That is a plan that the DOD put in place, an initiative that focuses on the financial management by improving internal controls and resolving material weaknesses in advancing the department's fiscal stewardship. In a nutshell, they got to get better at their record keeping across many facets of the financial management spectrum. Now, audit readiness 
for the DOD involves property, plant equipment, operating material, and supplies. So that's a pretty broad net of category, which means they need better accountability. But they also go out of their way, and this has happened since the very beginning of FIRE, to put highest priority on accounting controls and accountability for all mission critical asset information. And that's where you all are involved. Now, how we got here. Now you can see the, the chart states 2011, the FIRE initiative begins. In, in this case, we heard uh, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta call this initiative an all hands on deck. In 2011, the DOD was not audit ready. Now, this did not start in 2011. We'll call this the more modern historical perspective on it. This whole initiative really dates back to the 1990 CFO Act, where that act uh, dictates the need for all government agencies, federal agencies, to pass a clean audit opinion. And the Pentagon and the DOD is one of the only agencies not able to do that to this point. But as you're gonna see, they're making quite a bit of progress. Fast forward in, in modern history and we see 2020, uh, beginning in 2018, the commitment to audit readiness. At the time, Deputy Defense Secretary David Norquist stated going into 2018, knowing that that was the year in which they were committed to audit readiness, by spring, they're gonna have over 1,200 auditors inspecting the DOD from book to floor and from floor to book. Now, fast forward a year, he reiterates that th they knew going in, they were just no way they were gonna pass, that they didn't pass, but it exposed the issues. And he says, we we have issues and we're gonna go fix them. Now, fast forward another year, again, another round of failed audits, but more and more is being brought to light through this process as to where the material weaknesses are within the DOD in this audit progress. And in 2020, he states the audit demonstrates progress, but we have a lot more to do. And goes on to reiterate that being under audit will be our new normal. Now let's go ahead one more year here and let's get into FY 2021. The results of the FY 2020 audit were just released within the past 30 some odd days. In this document you see here is understanding the result of the audit of the FY 2020 financial statements. In that report, the DOD identified seven priority areas across 26 agency-wide material weaknesses. In the document, you actually might see it referred to as eight priority areas, but from our uh, research, we found it was seven priority areas. But across 26 agency-wide material weaknesses, one of those priorities is government property in possession of contractors. Once again, where you all come in. The report states that the DOD did not meet the goal. The goal being to reconcile contractor inventory data to DOD property records. The goal also being to establish a baseline of assets with the contractors, right? Tough to audit unless you have a clear baseline that you're coming in from. And then there were some all other policies that were also lacking and cited. But the DOD acknowledged in the report that the government property held by contractors as a weakness and provided its corrective action plan in the agency financial report. Now, the DOD plans to continue its efforts to validate and reconcile government property held by contractors, which is why they're gonna be knocking on your door. They also added that the DOD must continue to develop and implement new corrective actions related to property recording 
to properly, excuse me, recording government property held by contractors. For example, formalizing the DCMA's oversight to DOD component processes with proper controls will provide the component's assurance on the accuracy of the contractor's records. So this is a huge record keeping exercise and property and possession of contractors is getting cast into the spotlight. Now the impacts of property management, what, what it really means to be audit ready, we covered a little bit further back up, which is the mission critical assets and the definition. We're encompassing everything from military equipment, ships, aircrafts, and combat vehicles, to inventory, rations, supplies, spare parts, operating materials and supplies, ammunitions and missiles, and then general equipment, material handling equipment, training equipment, tooling, testing equipment. So that's the broad swath of, of asset types. But the financial record keeping for asset information becomes just as critical. To talk about unique item identifier information as part of the asset records being captured and reported. Category and type of asset. The location, status and description. The custody and the controlling and financial reporting entity. Remember the exercise here is not only to get accurate and complete data, but it's also to make sure you don't provide duplicate data, which you can imagine could be very easy to do. And all of this flows back up to accountable property systems of record, the APSRs. So the reporting entities must record assets within their APSR, which comes from you, by the way, verifying mission critical asset existence, as I said, from book to floor, and that they are complete records from floor to book, that you know what's on your property and that's being recorded back to your books. We also know that uh, serially managed assets has really become a focal point for all this. And the methodology that I have a lot of personal experience with dates back to 2004, which is item unique identification. And that policy was put in place to very specifically avoid the duplicate asset problem and make sure that assets are being tracked across all agencies from cradle to grave in a unique way, all those that qualify, of course. So the idea here is to use a two-dimensional barcode, an IUID, which actually is also called, you may have heard of it, called within the MIL standard 130 as a data matrix barcode. And the goal here is to capture, capture and register data for all the legacy assets that exist. You know, we're talking over 100 million in asset count of legacy assets. Uh, of course, GFP, as we've identified here, and newly acquired items. So anything new coming into the industrial complex that is the DOD already has this um, identification on it with a global identifier never to be repeated again. Now the the good news is this is an industry standard. It's not just a military standard. It's an industry best practice for quickly and cost effectively identifying, marking, and tracking critical assets. But if you're just putting barcodes on items, there's not a lot of return on investment on just that exercise. So you should be thinking about how do I leverage that mark for more efficient data capture um, as you're maintaining the property that has these marks on it. You probably are very familiar with putting linear barcodes on items, uh, but this is just a, a new and improved form of that um, linear barcode methodology. Of course, we're not just talking about the end items either. We're, we're talking about putting these marks on any critical components that make up those principal end items. Could be embedded parts, could be assemblies and sub-assemblies, uh, at A to B, we deal every day with uh, manufacturing organizations that need 
to be able to, to assemble and report this hierarchy of UIDs relative to the assets and parts they're shipping off to the DoD and making sure that all of that gets accounted for through you know, systems like wide area workflow. But it also, UID also relates to an automated and serialized item identification that enables your audit readiness within an accelerated fire timeline. Make sure that, by the way, the, the mark lasts the life cycle of that item. So you've got durability uh, considered here as well. And I think that's largely being done across the board for anyone who is uh, marking with IUID. The early days of putting a paper label on an asset is, uh, seems to be fading away quickly. So now let's shift our attention to DCMA's role in this. So what you see here is the DCMA guidebook for government contract property administration. It's a 114 page guidebook. Now, by the way, you see the March 2020 reference on this slide deck. Fact is, is that the guidebook you should be following is October of 2020, which should be downloadable from the PDFs uh, that are listed in the console here of GoTo, GoToWebinar. But let's, uh, let's unpack this guidebook a little bit and see what DCMA is being told to do in, in, in this guidebook. So the guidebook calls out the PMSA specifically, the Property Management System Analysis, which is a systematic objective review and evaluation of a contractor's property management system right, to determine whether it's providing effective and efficient control of government property in compliance with applicable government property clauses, contract provisions, and voluntary consensus standards or industry leading practices the, that's in, that the contractor may have incorporated into its property management system. So it doesn't want to bound you to just you know, some property clauses. It wants to say, hey, um, formulate your property management system that's aligned with uh, other industry standards that you can take advantage of. Um, so you, you know, you're not limited to the kind of technologies or procedures that, that only they're looking at. So this guidebook goes on to identify 22 elements of the PMSA, right? And it says they will be in fact assessing against some number of these 22 elements. Everything from written procedures, contractor self-assessments, to relief of stewardship, declaration of excess, storage commingling, property closeouts, right? Everything in between here. You can download and take a look at this 114 pager at your leisure. But what I've highlighted here are the areas that indicate where a government property management system can really help to facilitate keeping your records straight and being able to report against them when needed to do so in light of DCMA audits that either are coming or will be coming to your door. We get a lot of interest in and around the systems relative to the receipt, the receding in and automating the receding in of government property to make sure that that record is set and flows down to the right systems that need it. As that also um, receding against, you know, attachments that might be coming down from the GFP module or procurements. We also see identification, right? The, I just shared with you a moment ago, identification of assets using IUID or MIL standard 130 as a marking identification standard. But there are others too that can be used depending on the kind of GFP that you're handling, but machine readable codes need to be encoded, applied, and then part of the record keeping. Of course, there's records, 
There's performing of physical inventories with whatever regularity your contract is uh, dictating to you at this point. Subcontractor reviews, you know, the you're ultimately responsible for how this contract property gets flowed down to your subcontractors. Reporting, as always, um, area declaration of excess, the consumption and the movement of this of the uh, inventory or the materials and assets within your possession, the maintenance you need to perform on it, and then through to disposal and ultimately contract property closeout. So those are all areas where a property management system, the right property management system, can help to support a much lower risk engagement in how you're doing your record keeping and ultimately a much more efficient way for you to accomplish this. Which takes us to the role of government systems today. And what we see has been advancing for easily the past five years and seems to be getting into, let's call it a more stable um, area without a whole lot of things that are changing, which is good because these are systems that you need to be reporting data to. And this is where the government's going to get its good data that you provide them. So this ultimately boils down to a pretty significant e-commerce platform that the DOD put in place at the PIEE level, which is the big umbrella, the Procurement Integrated Enterprise Environment. It's a suite of government e-commerce systems. Now, GFP module, Wide Area Workflow or WAF, IUID Registry, they all have roles underneath in this umbrella. With WAF, it's everything to do with your invoicing and your receipt and acceptance of new procurements that are coming through or that you're shipping, I should say, off to the DOD. The GFP module, we just saw an announcement come out, a memorandum come out over the past week to two uh, from on high relative to the role of GFP module and how they're dedicating more resources to uh, providing this as a resource where you will be being able to pull data down from for your attachments of contract obligations coming to you, shipments and receipts, you know, being able to handle those transactions, providing updates through to disposals. And then the IUID registry, which is a system that sits behind all of this as well, used to be a little bit more in the forefront, but now it's buried under wide area workflow. And it's where all the item unique identification takes place alongside the GFP as the master data source where all this information is going to flow and these government APSRs will be pulling from. Now, not to be left out, but another little cloud-based government system that sits to the side is the PCAR system, which ultimately will migrate underneath the PI umbrella um, at the right time here in the not too distant future. But of course, that's plant clearance automated reutilization screening system. They haven't gotten it there quite yet, but they're working on it. At A to B Tracking, we um, are constantly involved and engaged in tracking how uh, these systems evolve um, in the working groups that they bring in, industry working groups, and ultimately how you know data in a very seamless way gets transmitted back and forth through to these government systems. Um, and the one thing I'll point out is that many of you probably know the web-based portal end of this where you can go in, log in through your web portal, but know that exchanging data through that, uh, through that approach is only one option. Really, these systems are set up for a direct submission through um, EDI exchange. Uh, EDI exchange, meaning electronically sending uh, files according to the formats and standards they've dictated uh, behind the scenes, which is incredibly efficient. 
um, compared to the web portal approach to entering it. And there's a lot more data that needs to be captured, stored, and communicated and reported um, back through to these systems with the extra added pressure of getting it all, all correct and accurate. So that brings us to the expectations of industry, right? And this is not a, a slide that I've created, but I've used it a few times now in many of the webinars that I perform because it's it's a great one surrounding this topic. It Brian Sykes uh, created this slide um, back in 2017 now, but it was from a GFP working group, um, which is the expectations of industry is to open the doors when asked. So the DOD components, as you know, have the right to view their GFP asset data upon furnishing reasonable notification, according to the FAR 52245-1. The DOD is defining reasonable notification for audit purposes as 10 business days. So exceptions, extensions, of course, can be granted on a case-by-case -case basis long as, uh, but not, of course, must not impede with the audit progress. So also industry partners are responsible for managing their subcontractors GFP and making those appropriate arrangements if necessary as well. So components need to balance the need of industry with the need of auditors, right? Um, schedule the visit outside of normal production hours to minis minimize disruption. But all this shouldn't be earth shattering. Other government agencies, for example, NASA, um, have the same challenges and are able to obtain a clean op audit opinion, right? So there is a workable solution. And it goes a little bit into the communications down below. But that takes us with all of those building blocks that come into view, everything from getting the data right to now this extra push to get the DOD to a good clean audit opinion with all these government systems and the role of DCMA. This brings us to what a modern government property management system looks like. And our role here is, you know, is as uh, we are the systems people, you know, we are walking through military warehouses. We are standing in shipping receiving docks. We are going in and out of uh, facilities and yards that have just an incredible number of military uh, or federal government equipment that needs to be used to support, you know, the, the, the mission. So we understand what modern government property management systems look like because, you know, we've, we've been around the block many, many times over in this area. And from our view, a system should have some of these key fundamental capabilities. So I'm gonna start at 12 o'clock here and, and beginning with centralized. So a common system of record keeping should be accessible, right? So that all locations can enter information into a common centralized area that are responsible for accounting for government furnished property or cap or even corporate assets for that matter. It should be secure now going clockwise. Data storage that passes all of the controlled unclassified information or CUI tests. Now that we know as industry is putting huge focus due to the requirements coming down of CMMC, um, the basically the cybersecurity standards to ensure that your record keeping is in a secure area that also can be audited. It needs to be accessible. Record keeping that can be updated and modified and viewed by multiple people with multiple devices. Not everyone is sitting behind a desktop anymore. We've got mobile mobility very much the forefront of the way that we do business today. The use of tablets, phones, and desktop computers alike all need to be able to access this modern government property management system today. 
and it needs to be integrated. And integrated by that we mean the ability to exchange data with other systems that could be either government systems or it could be your own internal ERP system, whatever system you may be using uh, to manage your, your own ERP, your own operations or MRP. And this is all really to eliminate the swivel chair and the silos of data and ultimately save significant amount of time from having to re-enter data or to make data entry mistakes. You know, just a quick short story here is we worked with uh, defense, con excuse me, we worked with one of the military components that had literally three different inventory databases that are tracking exactly the same items. None of them were in sync. They all had wildly different records and data, and there was not a single database that had the right information in it. So really what you need is a single master data set that represents the truth that can be audited against. That's key. Another significant advantage in the, how these government property management systems have evolved is the use of automation. So you know some of uh, a considerable amount of my experience comes in the space of using auto ID technology. What do I mean by auto ID technology? That means that you're putting a machine readable code somehow on the equipment and property or inventory that you're trying to track. So when using auto ID, and by the way, we see that there's lots of areas of government property that's being managed with at minimum a linear barcode that's been encoded onto a data plate or onto a separate asset tag. And that's great, except that we don't see that these organizations are using the barcode, right? They may not be equipped with the mobile technologies or the scanning technologies or the systems that can support the ability to scan a barcode and really automate the data capture about what item they might be looking at or how to perform physical inventories using it. These are, you know, really basic data capture technologies we see in the grocery store every day. So you can use barcode in a number of ways to scan or assign items to custodians or to locations or to perform inventories much more efficiently. And there's so many ways um, in which to apply barcodes. Now, I told you about this global standard. Scanners should have no problem reading not only the linear barcode, but at the same time, these item unique identification barcodes that I showed you a moment ago. There's also another kind of new and, and growing technology that's captured a lot of the imagination and attention for auto ID, and that is, you may have heard of it, called RFID. So RFID is, instead of a line of sight barcode scan of a physical item, you can use a radio signal to spread throughout a facility to capture the physical items and know exactly what you have on hand using that radio signal. So imagine if you could just see, quote unquote, asset and inventory data move from one warehouse to another or one room to another within your facility without any human involvement whatsoever. Today, you can put fixed RFID readers at key points throughout your facility and just sit at the console watching software on your computer tell you exactly how and where this equipment or this inventory is moving around your facility, in and outside your facility at any moment in time. This vision of RFID is very real today, and it's also much more affordable than you may think. We've also even begun more involvement in seeing the use of autonomous inventory counting where you can place robots inside facilities with RFID reading capability and perform regular, ongoing, continuous 
inventory counts of what you have. And that is the really the pinnacle of being as real time as you can get when it comes to your inventory counts inside your facility is having 24 seven robots moving throughout your facility and updating the record keeping. Now, again, this is not born out of the DOD or the Pentagon requirements. This is the evolution of technology in the reality of today's business environment in the way these technologies are being adapted. And, and the adoption of these technologies, you know, it's coming from the commercial need as much as anything. Another form of automation in modern government property management systems is that data exchange with government systems. And I really can't emphasize this point enough because the days of having to log into a web portal, start doing transactions, you know, maybe get distracted a moment, have the screen time out, losing all of your data because you were entering it perhaps, you know, and didn't go ahead and hit the right button to save it. It's just no longer necessary these days. Like I said, these government systems are set up so that you can provide direct EDI transactions through to them. Wide area workflow, GFP module, the IUID registry can all have direct data exchange through the, to these systems. PCARs, you still have to upload a file, but the file format that you need to get it into is extremely tricky. Anyone who knows and done PCARs transaction knows this, that it's a very, um, it's a credible number of steps to get it to the right file format and hoping that you got the data correct just to go ahead and upload that file through to PCARs. There is a better way of getting it into that file format. The, the other thing to please keep in mind too is that with a modern government property management system, you will be alerted to data that you may have entered incorrectly in any of your data before you go and hit submit. So that once you've hit submit and you've committed that data to go through to these government systems, you know it's gonna be good. And you don't have to know that 24 hours from now, you're gonna get a kickback telling you that the data is wrong that you submitted through to the system. It has built in filters and checks and balances on the data so that when you hit submit, it just goes to where it needs to go and your job is done. And your job is done. Another aspect of mo modern government property management systems would be to embrace the use of mobility. And the use of mobility may be just to be able to walk to physical property and inventory and update records with a mobile device. Or it could be, in a more evolved way, have built-in auto ID technology so you can scan a barcode or, or scan a uh, number of RFID tags all within seconds of where you're standing at any given time. But at, at minimum, to be able to advance your physical inventory capabilities so that you can perform that physical inventory without all the manual processing where you have to print out sheets and walk around and go check, check, check and make sure that you've got all the right asset types, you're looking at serial numbers, you're looking at maybe IUIDs and, and hopefully it's providing the picture you need. You just walk through and you scan and it's, it's an infinitely uh, more accurate and more efficient process than the way you'd be doing it. You know, we've, we we um, just recently were working with a, a company that had about 1,500 uh, items, pieces of government furnished property, and they're a shop of a couple people. They don't have time to go perform physical inventories on 1,500 items. There's not enough time in a day to do that kind of work. So they're exposed. They're exposed. And the good news is that there is absolutely a better way by taking advantage of what infrastructure may exist on your equipment or by you know, adding in this extra layer to make it even more efficient, depending on your environment and how you want to approach it. But also it's worth noting what modern government property management system is not. And what it doesn't look like is spreadsheets. So the reason why 
government property is extremely difficult to manage within spreadsheets is that they're not transactional. You can't keep a historical transaction. If you're putting one record per one row in a spreadsheet, you can't keep the historical transaction of what was done and how data was updated and who updated it and when it was updated. All that information that goes into a transactional database that gives you the true picture of this government property that you're responsible for. Spreadsheets also cannot handle the use of auto ID technology, right? To be able to scan barcodes and RFID tags. Now, someone out there is going to say, oh, I've got a barcode scanner to scan into a spreadsheet. Well, okay. You might try and put in some development hours to really get it perfected, you know, but a lot of development hours. And then at the end of the day, you know, is that really the best use of trying to use a spreadsheet to, to scan a barcode? Um, without a lot of error that potentially could result of, a, of these cells that transpose numbers and information uh, because an auto formatting thing kicks in. Also, uh, spreadsheets are not um, traditionally multi-user, right? So multiple people entering data and having, again, that uh, auditability as to who was entering what information, particularly for across many, many locations. And, we deal with companies every that have one or two locations up to hundreds of locations where they're handling government property. So you need that audit trail, that auditability. Spreadsheets are very error prone. You know, like I mentioned a moment ago, it's very easy to type in some number with leading zeros only to put it into a cell in a spreadsheet and the leading zeros disappear. And that was crucial to ensure that the, the data was being captured properly. And spreadsheets can't handle automated reporting um, through two other systems. Uh, you can try and upload spreadsheet files, but getting the formatting right, you know, we know is, is just a very difficult and cumbersome exercise that is just not necessary in this day and age. So where does that leave us? That, that leaves us walking back up and, and taking a look at really what's at stake here. What's at stake is your is your contracts, right? If your PMSA does not pass, you're likely to get a corrective action. It's possible that funds can be withheld from your contract as well. And of course, that is not desirable at all. Your reputation is at stake. Your customers, meaning the program offices, need your data to pass their audits. So when they knock on your door, you need to be prepared. Not when they knock on your door, you start to prepare. You need to already be prepared because of the time window they have in which to come on site and see your property and make sure your record keeping is where it needs to be. Now you may say, okay, well, we always have a nice long lead time between now and when the DCMA auditor shows up, we work it out and so on and so forth. And, you know, that's great if you have that luxury now, but we know that that can change, number one. New people can enter the picture, number two. So make audit readiness just the way that you do business, right? And when you do, you will have the control and you won't constantly need to be doing the cleanup work to get yourself ready when you know something's forthcoming and the stress that comes along with that. Your competitiveness is also at stake, making sure that you're not in jeopardy of losing your existing contract and setting up your, your own internal contract bid team to win future contracts. This is your chance of putting in a proper business system, one of the six key business systems, primary, by the way, that can help elevate you in your stature in the organization as a, as a department that needs the proper business systems that can be efficient and effective and maintain all the responsibilities you need to maintain as custodians of this government property. So most of all, don't wait to get called out for not having the right system in place. And here's the message to your program leaders and your financial leaders inside your organization. So to recap this, 
DOD is shining the spotlight on government property in possession of contractors. Your GFP and, of course, CAP as well, which is part of your obligation to uh, perform record keeping. Failed defense audits are driving this need. So it's coming from down from on high to make sure that this all gets swept up and is going in the right direction in the coming months, days, months, years. Again, the message is your data feeds these government systems, which feeds these APSRs. And that is what's getting audited against on the defense side. DCMA is formalizing their audit approach. As we see, this new guidebook has come out that will impact you um, to the way they're performing PMSAs. Adding that pressure to implement a modern government property management system. So just as you no longer manage your financials on a spreadsheet today, right? Your company does not operate off of spreadsheets in the finance department. I can almost guarantee you that managing government property on a spreadsheet is now not enough. So it's time now to invest in a GPMS that is centralized, remember, secure, it's accessible, and it's integrated, that leverages automation for time savings and for the improvement of the accuracy of your record keeping, which is exactly what the Defense Department needs. And avoid putting your contracts at risk. So I just want to thank you for your time today. It's it's an honor to be part of uh, NPMA and and being asked to speak today. And uh, here at A to B Tracking, um, if there's uh, any detail, further detail you want to get into, um, I may be able to answer questions right now. If not, we've got uh, an incredible technical team that can get into further questions. If if I can't answer them at the moment. So back to you, Kim. Thank you so much, Peter. I guess first I'm gonna ask if you guys hear the noise that was happening at the beginning of the webinar. I think it was me and my headset. So are you guys hearing any noise, Peter, on your end? It's a subtle noise, uh, Kim. It's it's not, it's not um, too distracting, so it's fine. Okay, well, I'm, so sorry, everyone. Um, I've done all these webinars and haven't heard that before. So there were two questions that I see um, uh, in the question box. So I'm going to go ahead and ask them. Um, one is, is there any discussion about access to centralized catalog management systems? Centralized catalog management systems? Yeah. Access yeah, that's to a it. That's a great question. I, I don't know uh, the answer to that. And I don't necessarily know that that is one of the systems that, um, well, I, the, the short answer is I don't know, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and then one other one um, was, um, is there anywhere that there is uh, noted about the difference between the March guidebook and the October guidebook? You mean that that distinguishes changes made between March and October? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sometimes in the October, the newer release, they have at the very bottom changes that were made and why they were made. I don't know if this guidebook has that, um, but I'm not familiar with where the change summary, or maybe even at the beginning of the guidebook, sometimes they summarize changes. Um, I uh, know personally the, the two guidebooks are similar in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, the changes are, are small and, you know, I think fairly subtle. But I, I would turn to, to DCMA to see if they could explain the differences between the two guidebooks. But, of course, you know, okay. October is the most recent release, so use that one as your go-to. I'm watching some, uh, watching some of the comments come in someone made a comment that the NDIA actually did some analysis on the guidebook 
Um, so for those who ask that question, maybe um, if you have an NDA representative, they could help. Um, let me see, there's another question. What does it take for the government to furnish property in as-is condition pursuant to FAR 52245-1DIII? Uh, just notate such in an Excel column within the GFP module of PI, and thereafter that GFP attachment is included in the task order slash contract. That was a question. That was a question, or it sounded a bit like a comment? That was a question. It did sound like a comment, but there's a question at the end. <laughs> So I guess maybe the first part of the question is, what does it take for the government to furnish property in an as-is condition? Um, I, I'm not really sure exactly how to answer that one. Uh, so I think I'm going to pass on it. Maybe I could ask a, an in-house team member to, to comment and send it to you and get back to whoever asked it. Yeah, um, I am seeing some comments come in. So one says the DOD attachment has a checkbox for as is. So maybe that's part of the GFP attachment then for them. Okay. Um, Good point. I love how we're all collaborating. This is very helpful. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. I, these are just, I think, a bunch of more comments um so i think that might wrap us up um then peter so again i just want to say thank you um all for um participating today and thank you again for speaking peter um this has been um, a great presentation and lots of information um i hope everybody has enjoyed today's webinar series again i apologize for any noise it's um, I can't hear it myself, so if I'm creating it, again, I apologize. Um, uh, all the webinars for the whole series of Asset Management Month will be um, posted again um, on our YouTube channel here soon um, in the coming weeks, so watch out for that. Um, also, I just want to give um, a big plug and um, information about our upcoming conferences. Um, the National Education Seminar will be held in Reno, Nevada, uh, July 26th through the 29th um, in person. Uh, it'll be at the Pepper Mill Resort. So um, I hope that you guys are going to be joining us and you can head over to the MPMA website and get the information. Registration is open. Uh, MPMA members can register for $975 and then for non-members, it's uh, 1,115. So head on over to our website, click on conferences, and you can get all the information. Um, again, I hope everybody enjoyed the pre this presentation and our whole series. Um, it's been a great month for Asset Management Month, um, and we get to close the month off with a webinar. Uh, so again, thank you, Peter, and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Kim, I can, I can tell you that on behalf of A to B, uh, we are excited to be at Reno um, in July, and so uh, we look forward to seeing you there and seeing everybody else there. Excellent. Great. Thanks yep. so much. You're welcome. Take care. Bye.